When you think of mitigating the effects of climate change, what do you think of? Maybe you think about renewable technologies such as solar farms and wind turbines, such as reducing your transport use or adopting a plant-based diet. But according to Project Drawdown, a collection of scientists who came together to rank technologies that would cause the largest reduction in atmospheric global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, the single biggest solution to reversing the effects of climate change is tackling refrigeration. Back in the 1920s, humanity was searching for a method to improve air conditioning and refrigeration. The primary issue was the chemicals used for refrigerants at the time. Refrigerants are fluids which can easily be forced to transition from liquid to gas and vice versa in order to remove energy in the form of heat from the system. Some common examples of refrigerants used at the time were ammonia, chloromethane, propane and sulfur dioxide. Whilst they all worked effectively as refrigerants, they were all either pungent, toxic, flammable, or explosive. The search went on for a high-performance refrigerant, which was also chemically inert. A collaboration from three American industry giants, Frigidaire, General Motors and DuPont, was formed, and in 1928, a chemical engineer named Thomas Midgley Jr. invented what seemed like a perfect solution, dichlorodifluoromethane, which was named Freon. Freon is an example of a chlorofluorocarbon, more commonly known as a CFC. The chemical ticked all the boxes. It worked well as a refrigerant, it was non-toxic, non-flammable, and it wasn't explosive. In the 1930s, General Motors and DuPont formed Kinetic Chemicals, and mass-produced Freon and other CFCs as refrigerants, which became widely used around the world. It seemed like all the problems with refrigerants were solved with this remarkable Freon molecule. Freon alongside similar molecules worked effectively for decades. That was until the late 1970s, when scientists around the world observed that the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere was rapidly depleting. A couple of years earlier, in 1974, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California called Mario Molina published a paper in the journal Nature theorising that UV light could break down CFCs in the atmosphere, causing a chlorine ion to detach from the CFC molecule and react with ozone to form chlorine monoxide and oxygen, thus depleting the ozone region. He was eventually proven right, and in fact, chlorine monoxide can then go on to react with oxygen, further continuing this breakdown in a short chain reaction. It turned out, CFCs were regularly being emitted into the atmosphere through poor maintenance and end-of-life cycles of refrigeration systems. This and other similar research formed the basis of the ban of CFCs in the Montreal Protocol, which was an international treaty signed in 1987 designed to protect the ozone layer. As well as dealing with CFCs, the protocol also made plans to slowly phase out similar molecules called hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or HCFCs, which were beginning to replace CFCs even though they still had detrimental effects on the ozone layer. In 1995, Mario Molina, along with his two colleagues Sherwood Rowland and Paul Crutzen, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for understanding and showing the negative effects of refrigerants on the ozone layer. As CFCs were banned and HCFCs were being phased out, it didn't take long for large chemical companies to design alternative refrigerants. In the early 90s, the most common alternative was a class of molecules called hydrofluorocarbons, or commonly known as HFCs. HFCs are very similar to CFCs, or HCFCs, except they do not contain chlorine, which was the key element destroying the ozone. Yet again, it seemed that the issue with refrigerants was solved, and everyone could call an end to the problem. Sadly, this wasn't the case. With the most common HFC being nearly 4,000 times more damaging to the climate than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period, and currently makes up around 1% of total greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Until recently, HFC emissions were also growing at a rate of 10 to 15% per year, making HFCs a huge problem for global warming. Finding nearly identical replacements for damaging substances is sadly too common a theme, and is directly analogous to DuPont's replacement of PFAS, of which 5,000 similar and less regulated chemicals have been designed, with similar horrible prospects for human health and the environment. Nearly 30 years later, in 2016, an amendment called the Kigali Amendment was officially added to the Montreal Protocol to gradually reduce the consumption and production of HFCs. This amendment has been effective since 2019 for high-income countries, with middle and low-income countries following from 2024 and from 2028 respectively. This time gap is designed to motivate wealthier countries to fund research into alternative refrigerants which lower-income countries can adopt. 
Now that the political motivation is in place, we need a method to replace HFCs with a less damaging refrigerant. Currently, cooling accounts for about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and as temperatures increase, this will create a positive feedback loop, requiring more global cooling and more emissions, unless we can manage refrigerants more effectively. This is why Project Drawdown listed refrigeration as their number one solution in the book The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming. We will leave a link to this book in the description. It's well worth a read. Tackling this problem is cited on Drawdown's website to be able to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by between 101.28 and 108.28 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, which can be broken down into 57.75 gigatons in refrigerant management and between 43.53 and 50.53 gigatons in seeking alternative refrigerants. To put this to scale, offshore wind turbines are predicted to reduce emissions by around 10.44 to 11.42 gigatons, and electric cars are predicted to reduce emissions by 11.87 and 15.68 gigatons. So we can really see how important tackling refrigerants is. Remarkably, one of the leading alternatives is a refrigerant we've had available since far before the discovery of Freon, ammonia. Ammonia was first liquefied in 1820 by Michael Faraday, who you may recognise from revolutionising many other areas of physics and chemistry. And if you ever studied physics or engineering, he's probably the reason you spent ages trying to remember that left-hand rule. Ammonia is a relatively common industrial refrigerant, and is even 10-20% to cheaper than HFCs, but is not used in many other industries due to its unpleasant odour. We can see from this open access journal article in Nature Communications that ammonia has little to no global warming potential. A measure of how warming a chemical is on a scale where carbon dioxide is equal to 1. Ammonia has such a low global warming potential as the chemical is so short-lived in the atmosphere. However, it is worth noting that the current method for producing ammonia is extremely energy intensive and is currently responsible for an estimated 2% of fossil fuel energy use. Another upcoming class of refrigerants are hydrofluoroolefins, or HFOs. HFOs show remarkable potential as refrigerants and also have relatively low global warming potentials, estimated to be between 0 and 4 over a 100 year period, depending on the exact chemical used, which is much less than HFCs over a period of 100 years. This is due to the relatively low reactivity of the carbon double bond with other reactive chemicals in the troposphere. These HFOs are starting to be mass produced by many companies, most notably Camors, a DuPont spin-off, the very company who was largely responsible for the problem in the first place. Now that we have discussed the implications and global warming potential of refrigerants, what can you do about it? Firstly, and beginning to this point in the video, you've already started doing this, educate yourself on how damaging these refrigerants are. We will leave references in the description for you to learn more. Secondly, make sure if you ever buy a refrigerator or air conditioning unit to ensure it's properly dealt with at the end of its life cycle. The average quantity of refrigerant in a home refrigerator containing HFCs is equivalent to the emissions of driving around 2,500 kilometers in an average car. So poorly managing just one fridge can be extremely damaging for the environment. In many countries, legislation exists to enforce this. For example, in the UK, when your fridge breaks, you are legally required to take it to a licensed waste facility where a technician removes the refrigerant. We will leave a guide on how to do this in the description. Thirdly, if you're planning on buying a new refrigeration unit, investigate the option of using one with a low global warming potential refrigerant. It's not always easy to know what refrigerant is being used, but in many countries, labeling systems are being implemented, so be sure to check if this exists where you live. And finally, make sure you keep this in mind when you are considering political candidates on your local or national level. Make sure they are committed to environmental causes such as this. Ultimately, we have seen how drastic a change can come from something like the Montreal Protocol, and these changes can only be driven by politicians who see them as an important issue to their voters. If you want to support the content our Eden makes, be sure to check out our Patreon by clicking on screen or in the link below. Here you'll get early ad-free access to our videos, hear our audio bloopers, and be able to donate 10% of your subscription to a charity of your choice. And as always, look after yourselves, each other, and most importantly, the planet around you. Thanks again, our Eden.